Now we will talk about the hypothesis tests concerning variance and there are two kinds of tests that we look at. Tests concerning a single variance and here we use the chi-square test statistic and then tests concerning the equality or inequality of two variances. These are based on the F test which is a ratio of sample variances. Let's look at the first scenario in more detail, tests concerning a single variance. Again, I will give you an example and then explain this in the context of a example. Say you have the New York Stock Exchange and you have a certain view related to the variance of returns on the New York Stock Exchange. You believe that this variance is less than 20 just to pick a number let's see how we will go about this the larger principle is that we'll use the chi-square test the chi-square test is used for hypothesis tests concerning the variance of a normally distributed population again note that the population has to be normally distributed for us to use this test sigma squared represents the true population variance and sigma naught squared represents the hypothesized variance which in my example is 20. Here, here is the hypothesis that we will consider h naught sigma squared greater than equal to 20 because that's the number i picked here versus the alternate that sigma squared is less than 20. this is just one example we could also have a hypothesis such that sigma squared is equal to 20 versus uh, alternate that sigma squared is not equal to 20. This would be a two-tailed test where you want to show that the variance is not 20. Again, depending on what you are after, you would set up the null and alternate accordingly. You then draw a random sample from a normal population. Again, this is emphasizing the point that for this test to work the distribution of the population has to be normal and your sample that you draw from the population has to be a random sample you then compute the chi-square test statistic using this formula the items here are self-explanatory n is the sample size s squared is the variance that you compute from the sample and sigma naught squared is the hypothesized value, which is 20 in this example. You then determine the rejection points by looking at the chi-square distribution. Since we are using a chi-square test statistic, we should use the chi-square distribution. And as we have done before, we then compare the test statistic with the critical value and decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. Let's look at an uh, example. Consider fund alpha, which we discussed in an earlier example. This fund has been in existence for 20 months. During this period, the standard deviation of monthly returns has been 5%. You want to test a claim by the fund manager that the standard deviation of the monthly returns is less than 6%. So do this on your own before you look at the answers on the subsequent slides you should be able to come up with a null and alternate you should be able to come up with the test statistic based on the formula that i just showed you critical value or rejection points given a 0.05 level of significance this is slightly tricky because we've not talked about the chi-square distribution so let's do that now this is what a chi-square distribution looks like. Given that the distribution is related to variance and variance cannot be negative, therefore the chi-square distribution is bounded at zero. We need a degrees of freedom, which is n minus one. In our example, n is 20, that's the sample size. So the degrees of freedom is 19. We are told that the significance is 0.05. When we are using the chi-square distribution, a significance of 0.05 means the left part of the distribution. The probability in the right tail then becomes 0.95. If you look at the chi-square table, 
you are looking for 0.95 because we are concerned with the probability in the right tail degrees of freedom 19 that's our scenario and this is the number we are after the critical value is 10.1 here is the answer now this is how we set up the null sigma squared greater than 36 note that 36 is 6 squared because the claim is standard deviation less than 6 we are talking about variances which is 6 squared the chi squared statistic is calculated using the formula that we have discussed you should get 13.19 the rejection point based on degrees of freedom equals 19 and significance of 0.05 is 10.1 we just saw that and now since the test statistic 13.19 is higher than the rejection point we cannot reject the null hypothesis i want to emphasize a point here note that the alternate hypothesis is that the variance is less than 36 that's what you are after when you want the variance or you are hoping that the variance is less than 36 then the statistic that you calculate the chi square statistic in this case should be a low number for you to reject the null the question then becomes how low and the answer is it needs to be lower than the critical value in this case the test statistic that we calculate is not lower than the critical value hence we cannot reject the null hypothesis now we will look at tests concerning the equality or inequality of two variances first high level and important point is that we need to use the f test when we are comparing two variances and as we've seen before for this test to work the population must be normally distributed if the population is not normally distributed then we cannot use this test and again as you've seen before the samples must be independent hypotheses for a two-tailed f test of differences in the variances can be structured this way you would use such a null and alternate hypothesis if you believe that the variances of the two populations are different let's go back to an example that we've been discussing you have two populations the new york stock exchange and the national stock exchange most specifically we have the returns of stocks on the new york stock exchange versus returns on the national stock exchange obviously there is a variance number for both these exchanges and you are concerned about whether these two variances are equal or not the test statistic for the f test is simply the ratio of the sample variances so you draw a sample and you will have a certain variance for this sample we call that s1 squared and here we have s2 squared the ratio of these two will be the f statistic when we do an f test given that we have two populations and two samples we have two degrees of freedom if your sample size here is 50 then the degrees of freedom would be 49 and here the degrees of freedom would again be n minus 1 as a convention we always take the larger sample variance in the numerator that helps ensure that the f statistic is always greater than 1 a few words about the f distribution because this is used to compute the critical value the f distribution is right skewed it is bounded by zero because the ratio of two positive numbers two variances has to be positive the shape of the f distribution is determined by two degrees of freedom one pertaining to the numerator one pertaining to the denominator we have seen that the rejection region is always in the right tail of the distribution if you look at a f table you will see degrees of freedom in the top row and degrees of freedom in a column that's because of this statement over here that you need two degrees of freedom 
and in a F table right up front you will be told that this table is for a certain probability and that might be say 0.005 just as a example so for every probability there will be a different table consider an example now you are investigating whether the population variance of the Indian equity market changed after the deregulation of 1991. You collect 120 months of data before deregulation and then 120 months of data after deregulation. Variance of returns before deregulation was 13. Variance of returns after deregulation was 18. So you want to know whether this difference is statistically significant. So you set up the null hypothesis which is like this and the alternate which is this. Here are your two populations. One is the before situation which we are calling 1 and the after which we are calling 2. You then compute the F statistic, which is 18 over 13. Remember the convention that the larger number needs to be in the numerator. So we have 1.4. Then we need to know the degrees of freedom. In this particular case, since N is equal to 120 for both situations, the degrees of freedom is 119 in both situations. Based on the degrees of freedom, and a significance of 1%, we need to compute the critical value. If you look at the F distributions in your curriculum, you will notice that there will be a distribution for a 0 0.005. Notice that we are doing a two-tailed test, which means that a significance of 0 0.001 really means that we are looking at a probability of 0 0.005 in each of the two tails. This results in a critical value of 1.6. In your tables, you might not see a degrees of freedom equal to 119. You might see 120, but that is close enough. Your critical value is 1.6. We then compare the critical value with the test statistic. If the test statistic is less than the critical value, which is the case over here, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. Moving now to tests concerning correlation, there is a hypothesis test for the significance of a correlation coefficient. Now the idea here is that we have two variables, let's say our two variables are oil prices and monthly returns of energy stocks. So let's say oil prices are represented by X and the monthly returns of energy stocks are represented by Y. And then we have 60 data points because we have data from the period January 2014 through December 2018. This means that we have 60 months of data. Now, for this 60 months of data, we are going to have returns for X, returns for Y. And based on this data, we come up with a sample correlation of 0 0.8. Now, given this sample correlation, which is denoted by R, so we can say R is equal to 0 0.8, do we have enough statistical evidence that the population correlation is different from 0? To test that hypothesis, here is what we do. We set up our null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the population correlation is zero versus the alternate that the correlation is not zero. Then as we do with other tests, we need to come up with a test statistic. And here is a formula that you must memorize. When we are trying to evaluate the correlation coefficient, the test statistic is R, which is the sample correlation, multiplied by the square root of N minus 2. N is the number of observations. In our scenario, that is 60. And then we divide by the square root of 1 minus R squared. So let's calculate the test statistic for our scenario. In our case, the test statistic is 0 0.8, which is the sample correlation, times the square root of N minus 2. N is the number of pairwise observations. So that is 
60 minus 2, which gives us 58, divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared, r is 0 0.8, so 1 minus 0 0.8 squared, and this will give us 10.15. So our test statistic is 10.15. This needs to be compared with the critical value. Now, if we are working at a 5% significance or 0 0.05 level of significance, and our degrees of freedom is 60 minus 2, which is 58, we can look up the t-table and we will get a critical value of 2. Also notice that this is a two-tailed test because we have a null hypothesis that says correlation is 0. Now, You've done this enough times now, but I'll still illustrate. So the point here is that we have a critical value of plus 2 and minus 2 based on degrees of freedom equal to 58 and 5% uh, significance. So these are the critical values. The test stat is much higher than plus 2. So the test stat is here, which means that we can reject the null hypothesis that the correlation is 0. So that means that there is enough statistical evidence that the correlation is not equal to zero. So hopefully now you understand how to use this formula, but from a testability perspective, memorizing this formula is crucial. So I'll help you memorize this. For the test stat, you start with R, which is the correlation. So that is in the numerator. Then that is multiplied by the square root of the degrees of freedom and then it is divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared. So you need to memorize this. The magnitude of r needed to reject the null hypothesis decreases as sample size n increases, and there are two reasons for this. The first reason is as n increases, the number of degrees of freedom increases, and the absolute value of the critical value decreases. So the idea is, let's say that you have another sample correlation and that is equal to 0 0.2. Now this is very close to 0. The question is, can you reject the null hypothesis that the correlation is 0? And the point being made here is that whether or not you can easily reject the null hypothesis depends on the sample size. If R is relatively small, you will need a larger sample size in order to reject the null hypothesis that the correlation is zero. And here we are saying there are two reasons for this. When n is larger, then the degrees of freedom will also be larger. And if the degrees of freedom is relatively high, the critical value will be lower. So remember, when we come up with a critical value, if we have a high degree of freedom, then this critical value will be relatively small, which means that it is easier to reject the null hypothesis. The other reason is that as n increases, the absolute value of the numerator increases. So notice higher n means that the numerator is higher, which means that the t stat will be higher, which means that it will be easier to reject the null hypothesis. So you also need to remember these points. Moving now to the final section in this reading, non-parametric inference. What we have talked about so far is parametric tests. These rely on assumptions regarding the distribution of the population and are based on population parameters such as mean and variance. Non-parametric tests are not concerned with the parameter and or make few assumptions about the population. These are used when the data does not meet distributional assumptions. Notice that we made assumptions that the population is normal. What if you cannot make that assumption? Then many of the tests we talked about do not hold and you will have to use a non-parametric test. Another situation is where the data is given in ranks. For example, you might want to study the use of derivatives at companies in Japan. And your study might be based on the relative size of a company. So you might want to see whether the largest companies make heavier use of derivatives relative to smaller companies. So there you will rank the companies in terms of size and then perform your 
tests. And then you might also use non-parametric tests where the hypothesis does not concern a parameter. For example, you want to know whether a sample is random or not. Here there is no real parameter, so you would use a non-parametric test. The Spearman rank correlation coefficient is a popular non-parametric test. The coefficient is calculated based on the ranks of two variables within their respective samples. Obviously, there is a lot more detail to this material, but in my opinion, for the CFA level 1 exam, you need to know the basic information presented over here. The probability of being tested on more detailed information, in my opinion, is extremely low. Even the curriculum points out that for more details on this material, you need to look at statistics textbooks. So that is it in terms of what you really need to know for this segment. Now coming to the summary of the most important points. This is the most testable material. For your parametric tests, the first and important point is that you set up your hypothesis, which will be your null hypothesis. And we will go with the most basic kind of hypothesis, which deals with a uh, population mean. So you might have a situation where the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 3 versus a alternate hypothesis that mu is not equal to 3. Just picking some numbers here. You then compute the test statistic and you must remember the formula for your basic test statistic related to the mean of a population. That is x bar minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error which is s over root n. You then determine the critical value, which is based on a significance level. You need to know where you can use the t-table and where you should use the z-table. You then compare the test statistic with the critical value and determine whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. This is the material that is absolutely essential for you to know. And finally, as I keep saying, once you have gone through this material, review the learning objectives in the curriculum and make sure you can say something sensible about every single learning objective. Go over the examples and practice problems in the curriculum, but keep in mind that these are extremely difficult. So if you have trouble with them, don't worry too much. The questions on the actual exam tend to be simpler. So, as I have said, for most other readings in Quant, practice questions from other sources like Schweizer. The more questions you do, the better you will get at this material. That is it. Good luck.